I'd like to thank everyone for attending today, and we're looking forward to having uh, this time together the next hour or so talking about cybersecurity uh, within the manufacturing space. I would tell you the, the goal of this was to be a workshop. So I'd ask for us if we're able to try to keep this conversational. If you have some, some thoughts or questions, uh, we'd love to talk about it. And um, I would just say we, we would like to keep it interactive. We are gonna be utilizing the polling capabilities on your application. So if you go to the mobile app, there's a section on the bottom stated called polling, hit the polling, hit our session. And then as the questions come up, we'll get some real-time feedback from you all. I understand that cybersecurity is a, is a private thing. Many people don't like to talk about it, but if you have something you'd like to share, maybe in the terms of uh, market trends or things that you're seeing in, in your industry, please just raise your hand. We'd love to have a discussion. Um, I'll start with our introductions and agenda first. Um, we're gonna talk about the top global risk factors within cybersecurity, the state of the cybersecurity business through threat actors and motivations, and manufacturing vertical and focus. Uh, my name is Dave Andor Soler. I'm the AVP for Industry Solutions for our Manufacturing, Transportation, and Consumer Packaged Goods Vertical. Uh, with me is Carissa Brockman. Uh, she's a Principal Architect for Cybersecurity. Um, I was able to sell her on coming here for this because it was a nice break from Minneapolis to come down to Orlando. Uh, you guys know this probably have 70 degree temperature change over there last week. So she was happy to come down to Orlando and meet with you all. Um, we'll start with the cybersecurity risks and concerns for manufacturing. And that will be our first polling question. So grab your phones. <laughs> Is everybody having a problem with the app? It's working? So try it one more time. Is cybersecurity one of your primary concerns for the stability and growth of your business? We'll give it another second. It looks like 95% is yes. That's good, Chris, right? We're at a cybersecurity workshop. We're about 95%. Who said no? No. There you go. So these were some of the polling trends that we found around primary concerns. You know, you look at security is number three. And these are across a broad range of industry trends um, that are happening across, across the manufacturing space. Uh, the cost of regulations, the workforce shortage, but day-to-day -day safety and the cost of capital are all on the top of the list. And it's interesting to see how cyber, cybersecurity has made it to the top of the list, at least from number three. Um, I thought this was interesting, and Chris, I feel free to, to jump in here, but if you look three years ago, cybersecurity wasn't on the list of the top five global risks in terms of likelihood. And now here we are in 2018, 2019 now, um, there are two of the five. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? What are you seeing as you're talking to customers and the manufacturing and cybersecurity space? Yeah, and this is from the, the World Economic Forum. Um, you know, cybersecurity, now that it's part of top five global risks, um, and there's also, as we know, a big shortage in cybersecurity talent. Um, today it's around, I think, 500,000 unfulfilled jobs, and they're predicting by 2020, which is next year, you know, 1.5 million unfulfilled jobs. Um, with that, and along with attacks becoming more sophisticated, um, with resources both in you know, people and money um, sponsoring these adversaries. It's really kind of a perfect storm for all industries when it comes to cybersecurity. And what are your thoughts on management's view? You know, we talked about this a little bit uh, recently. I mean, as you're out visiting with customers, what's the board looking at this? How are the executives looking at cybersecurity now that it's hitting kind of the top two of five trends that you're seeing? Yeah, I would say in the past few years, three years or so, it's really getting management's attention um, in the manufacturing industry. I mean, even in the last couple of weeks, I've talked to about five manufacturer firms. Um, and 
it's kind of one or two driver, one of two drivers behind what they're looking for. Um, either it's their board is saying, you know, where are we today in terms of cybersecurity? Could we really respond to an incident if it occurred? Um, or two, the um, director of IT or whomever is trying to drive this forward wants to have an assessment done so they can show from an objective third party, you know, where they stand in terms of cybersecurity to actually get executive support. So, you know, in the past, executives in the manufacturing industry really have not had cybersecurity as a top priority, but we all know with um, what's occurred at Target and all the headlines in the past few years, it's, it's raising their attention. Good, thank you. We'll move forward into drilling down a little bit more into manufacturing, keeping manufacturing in focus here. You know, the, the thing that I see here is there's, um, Krista, there's enough? still a lot of opportunity. Not loud enough? There we go. All right, thank you. Krista, there's still a lot of opportunity here as you look at the overall statistics. You know, there's still a lot of growth in terms of companies um, feeling safe and secure from a cybersecurity standpoint. I mean, why do you think manufacturing has become such a target? Well, intellectual property is a biggie, as you all know. Um, competitors and nation states want to get that intellectual property so they can, you know, uh, thwart the R&D development efforts and the resources it takes and steal that information and cut costs on their side as well as, you know, there are just actors who want to just cause disruption or competitors who want to cause disruption. Um, <clears throat> also, in terms of, you know, that's kind of the why of why they're targeted, um, but also manufacturers have kind of broadly speaking, not everybody, um, has been lagging behind in terms of cybersecurity maturity. You know, the financial sector, retail, you know, have been driven by cybersecurity compliance regulations and have been targets in the past many years in terms of cyber attacks, whereas manufacturers have not been. Um, and now, given the lack of maturity, again, not in all cases, um, and the drivers behind it, they are becoming a target. Good. Any questions so far? Any comments? Okay, we'll keep moving here. So the outlook, I think, is you look at uh, different strategies that companies are looking to take. I think one of the things I've been thinking through is the, the convergence of this risk, um, the operational risk that's happening, and really the need for a single leader to look at things from a security standpoint. Yep. You know, and I, I think sometimes as I work with manufacturers, uh, there's a little bit of fragmentation between OT, operational technology, and IT. Um, so what are your thoughts on you know, kind of looking through you know, different strategies to mitigate the risk. And then as, as we move forward, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the risk assessment strategies that are out there as well. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, we know that OT has different priorities than IT, right? IT typically is focused more on confidentiality and OT is focused on availability. And as such, there have been different leaders managing kind of digital and cybersecurity risks within organizations. Um, you know, one on the OT side and one on the IT side without visibility um, into each other's environments. We're seeing a trend now where organizations are creating um, a function that oversees all digital and cybersecurity risks, both from an OT and IT perspective, which then, <clears throat> you know, allows that function and a single leader really to be accountable for all of that risk within the organization, as well as, you know, given the cybersecurity workforce shortage, you can cross train those resources, um, both from a, you know, OT and IT security perspective. 
So it can be a win-win across the board to leverage those resources, but then also have a holistic view of operational digital risk within your environment. Good. Do we have any questions in the back or? Okay, I thought we had one. Are you all, all right. how is it within your organizations today? <coughs> Do you have um, somebody responsible for kind of IT risk or IT security within the corporate environments and then somebody else responsible? Is there visibility, sharing, collaboration? No one. <laughs> No one wants to take the mic, but I saw a couple no's, right? That's good. All right, so let's, let's make it interactive. Let's go back to the polling. You can pull out, pull out your app. What is the number one technology or capability you require to transition to the factory of the future? pretty even distribution. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, we will close the poll here in the next 10 seconds. And thank you for participating. <laughs> All right, it's pretty similar, you know, in terms of what what we see. You know, I spent the last 4 years in our Internet of Things organization. And you, you definitely see the different use cases coming inside of manufacturers. You know, the sensor costs are coming down. Um, so it's, it's no surprise to see I, IoT continuing to be such a, a strong player um, inside of the manufacturing industry. And I think we'll continue to see that as new technologies um, come out. You know, one of the things that, that we're thinking a lot about is um, edge computing. You know, so multi-access edge computing from an IoT standpoint, trying to keep that information that you need at the edge versus sending it all the way back to the cloud, especially um, for really latency sensitive applications. So I'm sure just to raise a hands, we, this is not a cybersecurity question, but latency on the factory floor for your, your equipment is really important, right? Just to raise a hand. I mean, how, that's important. As I think and look at uh, capabilities around the edge and then the future capabilities that 5G will bring for manufacturers, I think that's going to be a really interesting opportunity for low latency type applications, continue to bring the next evolution for IoT. And uh, that's an area that I'm passionate about, been doing it for four years, and I think in this space is going to continue to grow, which I think continues to bring more complexity for cybersecurity. Um, as more devices and applications get put on the network, um, and then the access to third-party data and the partners that you have, I think it becomes more complicated. And that's where I think cybersecurity will continue to remain, you know, one of the top two or three things that, that companies are looking to solve um, as, you, as you go through kind of the OT and IT environment. So, Chris, I mean, what are your thoughts on how do you help a company? I just mentioned IoT growth. Um, mm -hmm. The concerns around security was was up there number one. Um, there's new devices being deployed. You have third party suppliers that want access to that information. You rely on them to provide that information to you. It goes both ways. I mean, how do you help customers from a cybersecurity standpoint make sure their environment secure? What are some of the steps that you you suggest taking? Well. <laughs> Everyone probably hates the word assessment, but, um, and especially in the manufacturing industry, right? Um, because of the complexities of the environment. I mean, you have the IT or the corporate environment, but each plant or factory may have, you know, each plant or factory is not cookie cutter or they are not necessarily similar to each other. There's different manufacturing processes going on in different factories or plants. They have different technologies and equipment that they're using. Um, 
some uh, plants are make more money than others and are a little bit you know considered you know the priority or could be a little riskier to the business um, of course there's older technologies that nobody wants to touch because they're scared that you know they could cause some downtime um, a recent customer, and I'm going to walk through a case study in a few slides, but um, we did do a, a plant assessment, and the it was very on um, the perimeter was very secure. You know, there was barbed wire fences. You you know had to leave your driver's license with the guard. They escorted you in. Um, there was cameras all over the outside of the facility. But then once you got in the plant itself, there was you know, no cameras, um, a computer sitting there wide open with the password stuck to the monitor. Um, we asked, you know, what, what, what's that for? What, what does that do? And they answered, we don't really know, but we're afraid to touch it because <laughs> it could do something. <laughs> we don't want to touch it. So. Um, Really, you need to start small because, you know, given that in other organizations like financial services, you know, each of the banks are very cookie cutter. Or the data centers are very cookie cutter. So you can take a sampling approach. Um, very different in the manufacturing industry with, you know, the plants being very different. So you have to start somewhere. So you start with, you know, the riskiest plant or, you know, the one that's going to have the biggest impact to your business, the biggest value to your business, and understand what's going on there. Um, know what those assets are doing. You know, you can't always take uh, traditional security measures of patching, 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 because um, some of those systems can't be patched, so you have to put in, you know, compensating controls around around those systems. So it's really imperative, and I don't need to tell you this, to, you know, understand what the business impact of those systems are um, to your organization. So then you can determine the the most appropriate strategies to to protect that environment. Um, so really, you know, in this, in this case, start small. You can probably come up with some strategies. And when I go through this case study, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Come up with strategies that apply across the environment, um, but considerations for uniqueness in each of the plant environments, if you will. Good. That was really good. Thank you. All right, let's go back to polling here. Here we go, thank you. Have you conducted an end-to-end -end cybersecurity risk assessment, assessment that considers IoT as part of the overall risk? You know, while we're doing that, Chris, one of the things I was thinking about is, given the, the fact that the environments are changing so frequently, and we talked about everybody's doing these assessments. I mean, how often should companies look to uh, do some kind of assessment? Um, well, that's a tricky question. Um, it could be on an annual basis. Obviously, you have to do um, targeted risk assessments focused on changes in the environment, and that's kind of a, a continual process. Whenever there's a significant change, you have to do um, those targeted risk assessments to understand how it's going to impact the environment from a cybersecurity perspective. When you look at overall, you know, um, business risk in terms of cybersecurity, generally speaking, it's annually. Um, that doesn't always occur, right. however. <laughs> So what are, your, what are your thoughts, so kind of taking that one step further around an internal assessment? You see there's you know, about a third are doing assessments internally, which I think is good because an assessment's taking place. And what are your thoughts on kind of that third party verification versus uh, internal assessments? What, what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, having a third party come in and do an assessment, you can get some perspectives with or across the industry. So um, you can look at you know what others of like organizations are doing to help protect their environments, the strategies they're taking. Um, a lot of organizations also want to know, how do I compare to uh, you know, my competitors or organizations that are similar size and complexity in terms of you know, cybersecurity maturity? And that's also something um, a third party can bring to the table. Lastly, we've had, we've been brought on board to do assessments because organizations want to hear from an objective third party. Sometimes it just carries more weight with executives to hear it from the third party rather than internal employees. So, um, you know, an advantage of doing an internal risk assessment, however, is you really know your business, you understand it, um, that's something a, a third party has to come in and you know, get that knowledge transfer and discovery of that environment um, before you know, they can make uh, an evaluation of, of what your current status is. So um, internally, doing it internally or externally, doing risk assessments is <laughs> a benefit. That's good. So maybe take a few minutes and walk through one of the ones that you've done. And I think perhaps maybe the, one of the more interesting things is what was the conclusion? You know, after you go through it, what did you find? Maybe take us through the journey from a customer standpoint and, and what they found in going through the, through the cybersecurity assessment. Yep. So um, this case study that I'm gonna take you through is not necessarily a um, traditional risk assessment in the sense that you know, we went through and identified all the threats and then looked at the vulnerabilities. Um, it wasn't necessarily a sequential process, but um, this organization is a global manufacturer of um, flavors, colors, and, and fragrances. Uh, they have, they had a fairly mature program on the, the corporate side. They adopted the, the ISO 27000 standards. Um, they had, you know, executives on board there. The challenges that they had was um, they have a, a number of plants and, and factories globally that they had no visibility into. Obviously, each of the, the plants were um, headed by, you know, the head of manufacturing. Um, they had a separate OT staff. Um, and the CISO was charged with uh, also ensuring that the, the plants were secure, or at least understanding what was going on with the plants first. Um, so they did need to start small. Um, and so they chose the, the plant with the, the greatest value to the business. Um, because they had adopted the ISO 27000 standards on the corporate side, they chose uh, ISA 99 um, for the manufacturing side because it aligns well with um, the ISO 27000 standards. And in order to, um, you know, do the risk assessment or identify the the threats and the vulnerabilities, what we did first was a workshop. Um, again, this was a shorter engagement because, you know, we can't pull folks off the, the manufacturing floor. We had to be very sensitive to um, plant operations, that sort of thing. So um, there was a lot of internal collaboration and coordination to get the, the mind share of uh, the manufacturing side and the the OT staff. Um, so it was decided that we would first start with a workshop that would bring all the key stakeholders together, um, which would of course then minimize some of the 
the discovery time involved instead of doing individual interviews and taking up a lot of um, those resources time we gathered people in a room and went through a you know what are the threats and vulnerabilities in the industry um, and they were sharing specifics with about the organization the client itself um, what does ISA 99 mean what is it um, you know what's required kind of a you know more of an educational assessment um, and then you know what what is a strategy or what is a roadmap to help the client get to the end state key steps that they could take um, generically speaking that then we would use as part of um, the rollout of the assessment so a, obviously, you need to understand what's in your environment, um, which is you know, easier said than done, of course, <laughs> um, especially given, again, the, the differing nature of each of the, the plants and the technologies involved. Um, so one of the tools that we've used, you know, there's passive scanners out there that can go out and um, kind of create an inventory of hardware and software. So that was, you know, one of the first steps. Um, the workshop then looked at, or the roadmap included, you know, of course, understand what the assets are and what you're protecting. Then the corporate side, because they adopted the ISO 27000 standards, um, did have policies and processes in place. So the, the ICS side could adopt some of those, um, but with, of course, unique considerations for the, the uh, ICS environment. So um, leveraging those policies in, and procedures in the ICS environment with specific tweaks, and of course, implementing those policies. Um, and then training the personnel. Um, and the there's going to be different training requirements for different roles within the organization um, those on the plant floor still need some training but it doesn't need to be you know as in-depth as the corporate side um, and then of course you know segmenting the the network um, the the IT and the OT network you know some of these organizations as I mentioned you don't need to go through necessarily a sequential process and do all or none um, when you're looking at risks and vulnerabilities within the environment um, you know that there are some big hits or low-hanging fruit that you can tackle right away um, Many clients that I'm talking to, you know, still have not segmented um, their IT and OT networks. Um, one that I've recently talked to, because of that, you know, there was a, a malware incident and it brought down everything. Um, and it's taken them months to bring back things, you know, bring all the systems back. And, you know, after three months, they were just 50% of the way there. So, you know, that is a, a, a big ticket item. Um, and again, easier said than done, and it's not trivial. Um, but that can really reduce, you know, um, significant amount of risk. Um, and then five, controlling access, once you understand um, what the systems are and who needs access to what, and of course, harden the systems. Um, removing unnecessary services, et cetera. Um, again, you know, some systems in the ICS environment can't be hardened, um, and so you have to think of different strategies. So, um, Laying out those key steps as part of the workshop, then once the, the workshop attendees understood you know, what ISA 99 was and what it means to them, then what we did was 
did a customized version of ISA 99 for that particular organization, which if you're all familiar kind of with the NIST cybersecurity framework and that, you know, the risk management framework that they have, um, it's really about creating a profile, understanding what your current state is, where you want to go, um, and then what you do to need to get there. Um, so we created the, with them, the customizable, customizable version of ISA 99, um, which was really, you know, the, where they wanted to be. And so then from there, we went and did the one plant assessment. Um, yes. 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 So repeat. repeat the, so the question was, did we did we bring in the third party vendors into the assessment? Yes, we did. We did. So we had a um, the vendor that actually did the scanning and, and set that piece up, um, and then fed into the overall assessment or the results fed into the overall assessment process. Um, Oh, and so then we did the, the plant walkthrough, um, and that's where we found this was the particular uh, client that, you know, very secure on the outside, not as secure on the inside. Um, and so it ended up there were lots of opportunities for improvement. Um, we developed a, a roadmap with costs and, you know, labor hours to get where they needed to be. Um, and presented that to executive leaders. And now they're going to be doing more assessments of plants, but they have the framework, they have the strategies down of how they're gonna move forward. And it's a matter now of you know getting visibility um, into each of those plant environments. Um, one of the, the first things they tackled, of course, was segmenting the, the IT and OT networks. So um, there was a little bit of a pause in between that initial assessment. And they were doing some work on segmenting that network, um, and they're coming back for, for more assessments. Good. Any other questions? You know, as we, we spent a lot of time talking about assessments today, but I think as you look at, you know, some of the challenges I'm seeing from manufacturers is they've, they've got so many different niche security solutions that they purchased. You know, they have 10 plus different types of security solutions. And if we could just take a minute and talk about, you know, how we help customers plug the seams for that. You know, there's gaps inside of that. We, we recently made an acquisition of a company called Alien Vault that is there to help us you know, as you look at, I think one of their sweet spots to help us is you look at the number of uh, security applications companies have, and then you, you mentioned the OT, IT segmentation, but in my view, Alien Vault's able to help kind of plug the seams, look for those gaps. Can you talk a little bit about what that's meant um, to us to help customers as another tool for you? And, you know, kind of beyond the assessment, you know, how does, how does that help in your working with customers? Um, specifically to Alien Vault, that's a, a SIM, kind of a cloud-based SIM tool, um, which is uh, easily customizable, has um, a nice dashboard, it's very user-friendly, um, and helps also with compliance. Um, and as we move forward, we're integrating Alien Vault with our threat manager platform that you know, helps, of course, identify threats as well as then we'll have the SIM solution um, along with that. In terms of, you know, beyond helping folks with assessments, um, one of the benefits of AT&T cybersecurity um, with our Alien Vault acquisition, by the way, we've uh, created our own standalone cybersecurity business unit of managed security services and cybersecurity consulting, of, of which I'm part of. Um, and I don't want this to be a complete sales plug, but um, the, 
the you know one of the biggest benefits is you know more often than not today organizations are looking for a strategic security partner um, in the past it's been very you know independent on the cult consulting side and you know don't come in and you know push products and solutions that that you have to offer but um, like David mentioned there are so many point solutions and tools that organizations have today, more organizations are looking to, to streamline security by having a partner that um, can do both consulting and offer solutions to help with their security needs. Good, thank you. So we'll move into question and answer. Uh, Chris has got a lot of experience working in the cybersecurity space with customers. So if you have any questions, now would be a good time. I think we have a, a mic in the back if we need it. Any questions? I will take a moment while you guys are, uh, see if we have any questions. I will say that we're, uh, if, if we could have the AT&T team stand up that's gonna be here in case there are other questions. Hugh is here, Hugh Arif. Hugh's got experience working directly with manufacturers. Guy Porman's in the back of the room. Um, we have a booth outside, we'll be here throughout the conference. There are questions that you have that maybe uh, you don't want to ask in front of the group. Uh, we've got the cybersecurity team as well as industry experts here. I will tell you that we also have a uh, free risk assessment online with the website, also a cybersecurity report. I encourage you guys to go uh, download. And I would ask that in the back you'll have, uh, if Guy will raise your hand again, and then Brittany. Brittany's in the back. Oh, I think we, do we have one question here? You have a question. Oh, okay, good, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my question is that when you deal with organizations that have a very large footprint of uh, plants across the globe, um, how do you execute assessments? Because obviously it's not going to be uh, competitive to conduct assessments and it's not going to be, uh, it's going to be time consuming to conduct assessments all across the globe. So what's, what, are the, what are the criteria to select a few plants that you would go about? Because on one side, you did say that it cannot be a cookie cutter approach when it comes to OT. But on the other side, you have this dilemma of too many plants to handle. So how do you handle that? Well, there most likely are um, plants that are similar in nature. Um, and what we've done in the past is look at kind of large, medium, small for a category, um, you know, the manufacturing processes for a category, and try to take a sampling of those different categories. Um, obviously, like you said, you know, doing 40 plant assessments is, <laughs> is not going to be cost effective nor would i guess that you know senior leaders would sign off on it so you know it's really about trying to understand what the business impact is across those 40 plants and categorizing in like categories if you can and then taking um, a sample from each of those categories Um, well, like I said, at least in this example, you know, there were the key steps of a, a strategy or roadmap you can follow. Um, again, there are going to be differences in the plants, but, you know, similarly, you know, you need to understand what's going on in the plant, what needs to be protected. You need to have the policies and processes documented and implemented. Um, you need to train folks, you need to segment, and maybe it's not just the IT or OT network, but further subzones within the network. Um, and that, again, needs to be um, evaluated via the risk assessment. And then um, harden those systems and, and continue to, to monitor. So, I mean, there's going to be uniqueness within each of those plants, but, you know, the general strategy can apply and it's all about 
um, understanding what what that uniqueness is. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? There's another one here. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. One more time. Purdue model. Thank you. Has nice layered security uh, architecture um, of you know consistency across horizontally and then uh, ele elevating layers of risk as you move up the model typically. With uh, IoT devices, particularly cellular connected IoT devices, it's very easy to deploy something in your plant at a very critical layer um, that can connect directly to a remote service, cutting across all of those countermeasures you may have otherwise installed in your plant. I'm curious, as how does AT&T advise clients to approach that? Do you have a particular model or approach that you say if you're connecting a device that's going to uh, connect directly to a remote service, here's how you do that, or would you say don't do that? <laughs> so I'll take the first stab at it. So we, we say absolutely do it. We've got over 34 million connected devices that are on IoT today. I'll tell you a, a couple things that we've done within our, our SIM management platform, which is the SIM for your phone. So think of that as a, a platform called AT&T Control Center that manages IoT devices and that mirrors the device IMEI number to the cellular SIM card number, and those are now mirrored together. When you connect to the, to the network, there are things that then goes through a registration from a security aspect. So let's say I take that SIM out of my IoT device on the manufacturing floor and put it into my iPad. It'll no longer work. When it tries to connect to the, to the network, there are, so there are systems and things that we can put into place from an IoT standpoint that we've covered in our IoT platform. But I think you, you raise a good point. Um, and I think, but I think we were able to do that by measuring and really working with the device providers that we work with, you know, so the companies that are creating the IoT devices, and, and then also using our platform to help kind of tie that together. That's one way that we do it. I don't know if you have another um, idea or suggestion you'd like to add on top of that. I think you covered it. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Uh, this thing you are mentioning is like a, a private network that you can uh, put some IoT device in a VPN with, to go inside the, the network, something like that? Correct. Yeah, so a good point. Another addition to that would be that we would be able to have that correct directly into the application. Uh, so it would be a private network that would create be created over the cellular network. So you have the device level authentication the cellular authentication to the tower to say, yes, we're good here, that they match, and then it'd be done and, and contributed over VPN to the application. Um, what type of things could an OEM manufacturer do to help with the audits, with security in general? It seems like we talk an awful lot about the IT side of things, but from the OT, actually where the information is generated, that security needs to be sort of a chain of trust if it will. I mean, if you could speak to that, please. Yeah. Um, can you speak to working with the vendors and some of the the product security? That we for, well, we work with all of the OEMs that are creating new devices that they're putting into the OT environment. Many of them are creating IoT-enabled devices themselves. So as they're putting devices into the manufacturing environment, they're enabled either from a cellular perspective or um, soon to be a 5G, and they're going to have those capabilities inside. So we work very closely with companies. I, I don't want to name the specific companies. Think of the large OEMs that work in the manufacturing environment. We do work with them to help a lot of the next generation products and services that they bring to the market 
are going to be enabled to help kind of have more of a seamless connectivity, you know, into their own cloud applications as well as yours. So I, I think it's part of the overall um, ecosystem of working with those manufacturers. I can list a couple that we've talked about publicly, UTC, GE, um, those types of companies we've talked and done press on publicly around how we're working with them towards kind of the next generation uh, of OT, IT type devices that they're bringing to market. That's it. Okay, so uh, Guy Porman, if you could just raise your hand, he's in the back with Brittany. And if you could help us out and have them, they're gonna scan your badge on the way up. I'd like to thank you for coming. I appreciate your time. And I look forward to seeing you all at the conference, okay? Thank you. Thank you.